Dan Kelch, who's usually the host of our First Fridays series in Special Collections and University Archives. Today we have University Archivist Erin Lorimore, and today she's speaking about African American employees on campus prior to desegregation. Thank you for joining us today, Erin. Hey, Stacey. Thank you for having me here. I'm glad we have the music, even if we don't have Beth Ann. I know. I'm sorry. I'm a poor substitute for Beth Ann, but I'll do my best. Aren't we so all? To get us <laughs> yes, we all are. To get us started, can you introduce us to some of the Black employees who worked on campus prior to desegregation? Sure. Let me pull up some photos. Can everybody see that? Yes. Awesome. So many of you have probably heard me talk about Ezekiel Robinson before, but for those who haven't, first of all, I can talk about Zeke for like 30 minutes, easily just him. Um, he's one of my favorite people in university history and um, frustratingly, one of the least known people, I think, uh, who had a massive impact on this campus. But um, Ezekiel Robinson worked here uh, basically from the time the campus opened. He was one of the first people here. He arrived just a couple of weeks after the school opened. He had actually worked with uh, founding president Charles Duncan McKeever at Peace College, which was Peace Institute at the time in Raleigh, um, prior to coming over here. And he kind of took on a role of the supervisor of all of the support staff. We know that in those early years, there were at least 42 Black employees on campus. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other folks, but Zeke's job was basically the supervisor of everything. But he also was doing a lot of other stuff. Um, he was the person in charge of ringing the school bell. So, you know, it's literally the campus bell that you still see at commencement and other special events. Um, he did a lot of work with campus landscaping. Like one of the quotes from Charles Duncan McKeever's wife, Lula, when they first arrived on campus was that the tree, the campus just consisted of a few trees and some mud, um, which was fairly true. A couple of buildings, some trees and mud. Um, you know, he had to help light fires in offices to keep the rooms warm. He delivered the campus mail. He um, was kind of the porter for special events. So he would carry materials, uh, make sure that McKeever kept to appointments. McKeever was a person who, um, we'll say, enjoyed talking and had to have someone keep him on task and basically drag him away from conversations sometimes. Um, and he also drove both Charles Duncan McKeever as well as visiting dignitaries. Um, either from the train station to campus or around Greensboro. So that included folks like Teddy Roosevelt and William Jennings Bryan and Anna Howard Shaw on their visits to campus. Um, and he was doing this with, at first, the campus horse and buggy. So he was here for, Zeke was here for a long time. During the time he was here, there was a transition from horse and buggy to, you know, automobiles from oil lamps and having to heat fires in all the classrooms to keep warm to electricity and central heating, from wells and pumps to running water. And he actually served under three different college presidents, McKeever, Julius Faust, and Walter Clinton Jackson. During the time Zeke was here, um, the size, like the physical size of campus increased by 10. And then the student body went from about 200 students to over 2,200 students. So again, he was here when the campus opened in 1892, and it's not until 1944, after a 52 year career, um, that he retired due to ill health. But even when he did, he flat out said, I'm gonna come to work on my good days so, and the college will just have to get along as best it can without me um, when I can't make the grade. He was actually, he came back to campus numerous times, um, especially every year, um, he would come back to campus as a special guest for Founders Day. We have photos of him with other um, charter faculty members in, you know, the 30s and or the 40s and 50s coming back to campus for those special Founders Day events in October. On December 1st, 1960, Ezekiel Robinson passed away at a local nursing home at the age of 93. He was actually the last surviving member of the faculty and staff from that first year that the state normal campus was open. Um, but again, I could talk about Zeke for forever. 
There are other folks I would also like to introduce you to. This gentleman is William Peoples. He worked for the college as a handyman from 1896 until his death at age 80 in 1933. He actually suffered a pretty major injury in 1929 when he fell from a ladder while he was fixing a window shade in one of the rooms in the campus infirmary. The Carolina student or the Carolinian student newspaper at the time described him as being in a semi-conscious stupor at Richardson Memorial Hospital, which was the segregated hospital for African Americans here in Greensboro. So like Ezekiel Robinson, um, William Peoples also, he had a son. Uh, both of their sons, interestingly, were professional musicians. Um, Zeke's son was a big band leader in New York. And William Peoples' son actually studied piano at the Boston Conservatory of Music and performed a recital of his own compositions um, in spring of 1928 in UNCG Auditorium. Um, he also had a daughter, William Peoples had a daughter named Tiny who worked as a housekeeper in Bailey Residence Hall in the Quad. Um, one of the other folks to introduce you to is Amanda Rhodes. She was a housekeeper in the dormitories in all likelihood for most of the time, um, most of her career was spent in Spencer, but she probably bounced around to a number of other places too. Um, the 1913 yearbook actually has some interesting information about the uh, black employees on campus, including Amanda Rhodes, um, noting that they wanted to pay a special tribute to her for quote, remaining at the college during the terrible fever epidemic when nearly all the maids deserted. Um, so the 1899, they're talking about the 1899 typhoid epidemic and the fact that she was one of the few folks who uh, stuck around and stayed on campus during all of that. And so one other person, uh, one of my favorite names, I think, in university history. I love Henderson Faribault. It's a great name. Um, he was actually the first chef on campus. The picture you see there, he's on the back steps of Brick Dormitory, um, which is where uh, the campus dining hall and kitchen and everything were. And so, you know, his job was largely, um, you know, not just cooking, but pre like preparing, so planning out all the meals, making sure we had what supplies we needed to feed all of the students, as well as honestly, most of the faculty ate on campus as well. Um, and so he actually um, was assisted by first and then later when Henderson Faribault passed away, succeeded by his son, Edmund. And so the final person to introduce you to is um, James Thomas. So James Thomas was, um, depending on where you see his name, either referred to as the keeper of the alumni house, alumni house at the time, or the um, custodian. But he was basically the person who kept the alumni house running from its opening in 1936 until he retired um, in June of 1953. Um, there was an announcement about his retirement in the alumni news when he retired in 53, basically saying that during the 17 years, there were very few occasions at the alumni house when James was not on hand. And there were a lot of things held there. A 1947 article actually has one of my favorite quotes. Um, again, the Carol it's from the Carolinian, so the student newspaper, but they wrote um, that a dance without James's punch just wouldn't be a dance. He's been making it since he was 16. Then it was made by mixing several different kinds of fruit juices. Now James uses three parts ginger ale to one part fruit juice. He says that the ginger ale, ginger ale adds zest to the flavor and makes it easier to make. I genuinely think that sounds much tastier than just straight up fruit punch. But the, those are some of the many folks who we've been able to find information on. Um, but, and I'll be honest, y'all, I gave Stacy some questions and I'm just going to ramble on through them. So I'm sorry, Stacy. <laughs> but um, I do want to talk a little bit about the fact that that is a very small number of people compared to the number of people who worked here on campus. Um, you know, I talked about, we know that there are at least 42 uh, black support staff members on campus in the early years of the university. And what you see there is actually a document 
that was found in a random folder in the Charles Duncan McKeever papers. And I think the folder is called like miscellaneous or something like that. It's miscellaneous is basically the word that makes all archivists cringe. This was in a folder that was just marked that. And it was a, a bunch of scrap paper, honestly, in the folder. Um, notes that McKeever had written that you sometimes couldn't even read. He did not have the greatest handwriting. But this typed list that says servants 1894 to 95, um, this is where we kind of can find those numbers. But one thing that you'll see is that there are a lot of people who aren't named. Their, tie, their, their job is listed and the fact that they existed is listed, but we don't know the names of the four maids in the dormitories. We don't know the names of the one servant in the dining room. And yes, these are all black employees. Um, they wouldn't, honestly, and I'll talk more about this in a bit, they would have been listed as servants in 1894 had they not been black employees. Um, but, you know, this doesn't even technically include everyone. Um, that picture, that's actually the construction, um, some work actually on an expansion at Brick Dormitory. We don't know the names of those gentlemen. They likely weren't actually employed by directly by the university. Um, we don't know who would have been, who employed them. We don't know where they may have come from. A lot of state property at that time was actually um, built using prison labor. People who had been arrested, almost always African-American men who were arrested for usually petty crimes. And um, this was part of the hard labor was working for little to no wages on state jobs. And so we don't know if that's who these gentlemen were. But um, when you go to, for instance, NC State or Chapel Hill or any kind of state institution, um, honestly, in most states, you will find that's not a North Carolina specific thing, but you will find uh, prison labor being used heavily um, for particularly for construction projects. Um, one other photo I want to show you all is this one. You know, one of the things that we saw listed were housekeepers and and maids and laundry workers. And we don't know the names of any of these women. Um, we know that their work basically ensured that the university functioned and continued on a day-to-day -day basis. We know that many of the employees actually lived in a segregated neighborhood that was a few blocks west of campus. Um, when last I checked Ezekiel Robinson's house that he was living in before he moved to a retirement home um, was still standing, uh, but it's in that area just west of campus um, where there's an awful lot of dorms, or not dorms, but you know, student apartments that have been built and houses get torn down on like a daily basis. So I haven't checked it since the before COVID times to see if it's still standing. But um, that was a segregated neighborhood. This was the outskirts of Greensboro at the time. And so most, um, most Black residents of Greensboro lived kind of on the outskirts of, of town. That's where the segregated communities were. And um, the area kind of around where uh, Jake's Billiards is on Spring Garden, that area was um, largely where most of our campus employees lived. I'll let you ask some, some questions though, Stacey. <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so how did you begin this research? So uh, most of it began two ways, finding this piece of paper and finding a little brief mention about campus. Um, servants in Trelease's history of the university. There's about two or three paragraphs where he mentions um, the black employees on campus. Uh, and Ezekiel Robinson is named there, but there's not really much information on anybody else. And so it's digging in and, you know, it's been a question of trying to dig in and find everyone else. Um, and 
you know, there's a phrase called archival silences that is commonly used now where silences are either purposeful, um, you know, a lot of Stacy's research on LGBTQ history shows some purposeful silencing where the community itself, it wasn't safe for them to document themselves. And then there are others where there are silences just because records aren't created. Um, and we see that today on campus too. Uh, you know, we have this massive campus records retention schedule that tells us what we should collect and what we shouldn't collect for university archives. Um, and unsurprisingly, what we should collect, what we should collect according to that retention schedule, you know, it's top down. It's documenting the big picture and not the individual people on campus necessarily. We don't keep individual um, personnel files for instance, after someone leaves campus. Um, you know, we have to make an effort to read between the lines sometimes. And Scott Henshaw, I don't, yet yeah, Scott's name, I see it now. Um, Scott does a lot of great work with our oral history program to um, document the stories of people here on campus today who might not show up in the records that we, you know, keep through the retention schedule and to keep documents of their personal experiences and to kind of make sure going forward that some of those stories are available for somebody else who might be looking at things in a hundred years. But, um, but yeah, it was just that kind of silence and that knowing that, you know, we have buildings named after most of the very first faculty on campus, you know, most of y'all have been in Starbucks and you've seen the picture of the uh, first faculty technically not the first faculty, but that's a much longer story. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of those people have, if not a dorm, then at least a scholarship or, so, or a room or something named after them on campus. Um, we were doing Founders Day events where we talk about not just Charles McKeever, but, um, you know, Anna Gove and other people who were here in the early days of, of campus. But we weren't talking about Ezekiel Robinson and we certainly weren't talking about Henderson Farabault or James Thomas or other folks like that. And so a lot of this was just wanting to broaden what we thought of when we think of founders on campus and whose story was worth telling or digging up. Um, there was a question in chat. Uh, have you done any work with city directories looking for additional names? Yeah, but the city directories aren't going to give us the ability to connect the names. We can make some guesses. Um, but, you know, like we know we know where Zeke lived because of a city directory, but um, it doesn't really help us pinpoint who the seven servants in the dining room were. Right. Um, can you tell us a bit about the desegregation of academic staff and faculty? Yeah. One thing I do want to mention, actually, before we jump to that, one thing that is also kind of complicating all of this is a question of how people are talked about and who we know things about. Um, the language that's used in description of people, but also just who gets described. The all of the people that I talked about earlier, Ezekiel Robinson, Henderson Farabault, Amanda Rhodes, um, James Thomas, all of these are people who had heavy interactions with students. And that's why we know what we know about them. Students thought they were important enough that students included a blurb about them in um, the Carolinian or in the Pine Needles yearbook. Um, you know, these are people who the students were interacting with on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, folks doing your laundry, you weren't interacting with them on a day-to-day -day basis. You didn't see those people. And so you didn't know those women by name. And so they didn't necessarily get an article written about them when they retired. Um, but we often will find articles in either the student newspaper or the alumni news magazine when certain folks who had that kind of impact and a long-term career on campus retired. But the language you see in those descriptions is very, um, it's very much, uh, honestly, it's, it's, a, it's a legacy of white supremacy and a legacy of racism, um, both in the way that people are referred to and some of the adjectives that are used to describe them and their work. 
So on the screen now, you see kind of at the bottom, a blurb that's actually from the 1913 yearbook where it says we can just mention a few more of the many servants who have proved indispensable to the college. There was Uncle Henderson, an old cook of the college. That's Henderson Faribault. Um, little Mandy as opposed to Aunt Mandy, which honestly reminded me of Wanda and little Wanda, but um, <laughs> they, uh, you know, the students were not referring to these people as you see later, Miss Kirkland who was the, uh, a white woman who was kind of, at the time, the dean of students. And so the black employees on campus weren't referred to by their last name. Um, often they weren't even referred to solely by their first name. They were referred to in honestly, what was a legacy of minstrelsy um, by aunt or uncle, whatever their first name was. But even once we moved past that kind of aunt uncle usage, you still see a lot of differences in how white employees versus black employees of campus in their retirement when they're talked about on campus are being treated. So behind, behind that, the two articles you see, one is Mr. Sink retires after 44 years and the other is James Thomas retires. These are both in the exact same issue of the alumni news. You actually can open up the alumni news magazine um, I think it's the spring summer 1953 edition and they are face to face like these two articles. Um, Mr. Sink is referred to as Mr. Sink throughout the article and it talks about, you know, how important he was and how responsible and how he was a supervisor and all of these things. Um, James Thomas is referred to as James throughout the article. You see the word faithful used an awful lot. Um, you know, to talk about uh, the Black employees upon their retirement. You see that a lot with Ezekiel Robinson, too. And so I do want to kind of talk a little bit about that, and that even when we're seeing these things, um, we're seeing the description, again, through the lens of the white students um, or other white staff who are on campus and the time in which this is being referred to um, and the language that was being used in, in these situations at the time. But um, to get to Stacy's actual question. Uh, the student body, for those who don't know, was desegregated in fall of 1956. It was not desegregated quickly. Um, there were two black students who enrolled in the fall of 1956 uh, and a small number added on top of that every year going after. It wasn't until two years later in 1958 that the first African-American woman was hired into an academic staff position here at UNCG. The woman on the left with the glasses, her name's Odessa Patrick. She actually had a bachelor's degree in biology from A&T. Um, she got that in 1956. And she came to campus working basically as the person who supervised the biology lab on campus. She was hired February of 1956. She was kind of the person in charge of like cultivating live specimens, um, setting up experiments and demonstrations for classes, keeping track of, you know, where all the equipment was and what they have. Um, in her third year, they actually recommended um, a promotion to an actual faculty status for her, but that was never, um, the person who was the department head at the time actually passed away before that happened and the new department head never pushed forward through that. Um, so uh, Odessa Patrick actually ended up working on a master's degree, taking additional classes at both Chapel Hill and here at UNCG. And in 1969, she got a master's degree in biology. Um, and that year she finally uh, was promoted into a position as an, a faculty member. And she ended up teaching classes in biology and zoology and physiology um, and anatomy. And so she was uh, really active on campus during the time. She was a Delta Sigma Theta. Um, she was treasurer of the Black Faculty and Staff Association. And in 1991, she was awarded um, UNCG's Martin Luther King Jr. Service Award. Um, she retired in 1996. So she was here for 38 years and um, was named an emeritus faculty member in the biology department that year. So again, Odessa Patrick came in 58. In 1967, that's the year that the nursing school was founded. And that's the year that the first um, African-American woman was hired into a faculty line. Again, Odessa Patrick was promoted up in 1969, 
But in 1967, Ernestine Small, the lady with the awesome checked coat on the right-hand side, um, she arrived as one of the charter faculty members with the School of Nursing. And she came from Tuskegee Institute. That's where she had her uh, BS in nursing degree. And she actually had gotten a master's degree in nursing uh, from Catholic University in DC. She worked at Moses Cone for a while before being hired here as a staff nurse. And she was actually, um, when Moses Cone finally integrated their space and their cafeteria, she was actually the first black employee to dine in the cafeteria at Moses Cone. So when she accepted the faculty position at UNCG in 1967, she wasn't just the first black faculty member here, but literally the first black faculty member in any college in North Carolina, other than the historically black um, institutions in the field of nursing. So she, when she was here, she also was the faculty advisor for um, the Neo Black Society. She, where Odessa Patrick uh, was uh, with Delta Sigma Theta, uh, she was Alpha Kappa Alpha. So she did some work with, with that group. Um, and she also, two years before Odessa Patrick received the Martin Luther King Jr. Service Award in 1989, um, Ernestine Small received that too. She also was super active in um, like the North Carolina professional nursing community. She was the first black president of the North Carolina Nurses Association in 1979 and was on the state board of nursing as well. But yeah, those are, um, you know, those are just some stories and some folks who, who have come up in research that said, again, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of um, overall folks um, who were here on campus prior to desegregation. I think a lot of times on campus, the story of desegregation starts in 1956 with um, Betty Tillman and Joanne Smart arriving on campus. But, you know, we don't talk about the fact that the majority of employees at the university in those early years were, were Black. And not only that, they were keeping the university running while knowing that their own, their own kids, Ezekiel Robinson had a daughter who wanted to be a teacher. And uh, she ended up going to Bennett because she wasn't allowed to enroll here um, because the, the student body was segregated. So, you know, they worked so hard and we're here because, because of the work that they did. All right, does anyone have any questions? If you do, can you please put them in chat? And I'll say Scott well, mentioned this, Dr. Small, Ernestine Small is still working in Memphis. Yeah, he's done oral history interview with her. So um, yeah, they, uh, she's very much still around. So we have the question, did James Thomas get along with Clara Booth Bird? That is a, a interesting question. And I don't even know how we would know that. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, no. Uh, again, mentions of James Thomas, we find him in the Alumni News Magazine and the student Carolinian. We find, we rarely find from those early days um, faculty members or white staff talking about black colleagues and employees. It's mainly students who are interacting um, on a heavy, a heavy basis with, with, with folks. Um, there are some letters in uh, the McKeever collection, a few from Ezekiel Robinson uh, to Charles Duncan McKeever. Um, some of them are really interesting. There's one that I wish I knew more about where he's like, sorry, I lost my temper, but I was right. Ezekiel Robinson's basically saying that. So, um, you know, I, it, it gave me the impression that he and McKeever had a relationship that might be a little bit different from most of the other relationships, especially since they knew each other before they got here. They worked together for years before. I mean, yeah, they were, they were together a lot. And like Ezekiel Robinson named one of his children after McKeever's daughter. Um, so they were good. They were good buddies, it seems. You know, there's still a power dynamic. But, uh, you know, it's an interesting, it's interesting to see. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions in chat. So I have one final question. Oh, here we go. 
Has there ever, ever been a plan or a proposed plan to create some side type of memorial or remembrance for the African American employees? Every year I ask students to do that. Um, that's something I push for every year. Um, and every class that I teach, uh, there is not anything formally in place. I wanted the auditorium named after Ezekiel Robinson. I lost that battle. But um, yeah, we currently don't have any, there are very few spaces on this campus that are named after any African-Americans. There's nothing named after Ernestine Small. There's nothing named after Odessa Patrick. Um, there's a, a parlor in Shaw Residence Hall named after uh, Betty. Tillman and Joanne Smart, but other than that, there are a few small spaces, but there are very few memorial remembrances, recognitions at all of um, Black employees on this campus, where we have a lot of buildings named after, um, after uh, you know, the early white faculty members who were here. Do we have any oral histories with any of the people you mentioned today? Uh, Ernestine Small. Okay. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> and that actually is an interesting story. So Ernestine Small got tracked down by an undergraduate student in my honors college class who got obsessed with Ernestine Small as part of her research for her university history class. And literally internet stalked her and just sent her a message and said, hey, I want to talk to you. And she actually was planning an event to bring uh, Dr. Small on campus uh, in April 2020. So we all know what happened then. Um, that didn't happen. But, uh, you know, that's, a, I always tell the students, it's students who care and students who dig in. That determines what gets attention paid to it. All right. Does anyone have any more questions or comments? All right. Well, thank you, Erin, and thank you for everyone who has attended today. Thank you.